YouTube event uh, from the Albertino, the, um, the Museum for Modern and Contemporary Art of the State Art Collections in Dresden. And uh, we are doing this as an experiment, uh, also keeping, of course, um, in tune uh, with uh, the experimental approach that also Microcosmos uh, is using in their works. And um, yes, so uh, as everyone knows, um, many events are postponed. The exhibition is uh, unfortunately closed, um, but we're really hoping that, um, yeah, that it will be, re be able to, to reopen in January. Uh, so this event here, uh, the listening session, is part uh, of the programming for One Million Roses for Angela Davis, which is an exhibition that um, basically traces Angela Davis' immense influence and legacy as an activist and scholar on contemporary artists today. And the background um, is, and that maybe not, uh, not everyone knows that, uh, especially outside of Germany, is also her status uh, as a scholar and as a sort of also socialist pop star almost uh, in former East Germany. Because East Germany in uh, 1971, 1972, uh, so while she was incarcerated and during her trial in the US, organized just a huge, very immense uh, solidarity campaign um, that played out through postcards for the comrade, of course, um, and through which she is now firmly anchored in the um, East German visual culture and cultural memory. And so for me, that was the jumping off point for this exhibition uh, to also bring together archival materials, historical portraits uh, of Angela Davis painted by artists uh, of the GDR. And of course, um, the existing international contemporary works that uh, deal or address also the issues she's been working on and she's still working on obviously today. And I was very lucky to uh, also commission new works for this exhibition. Uh, and those commissions uh, were, uh, are either looking at the solidarity campaign in East Germany, uh, at the iconic image, of course, of Angela Davis, or are also taking this a bit further. And they're looking at the mood, of course, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, also in the US. And uh, for me, and I think also for, for Stephanie and Justin, this is very important, um, is of course the writing of, uh, of Angela Davis and um, especially her in 1998 um, book um, of blues legacies, where she basically traces the, um, the blues traditions and examines the careers of three crucial black women blues singers um, through a feminist lens. And she's looking at um, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith and, and Billie Holiday, of course. And, um, and with this as a background also, I think um, we can now go um, to, to introduce Microcosmos. And I'm very excited that all of this worked out um, also technically, so we will see. <laughs> um, so Microcosmos is uh, composed of Stephanie Jamison and Justin Hicks, who you also see with me, of course, today here. And they've been working together since 2015 and uh, performed together first um, officially uh, um, in 2016, and it's an ongoing going collaboration. So they had uh, live performances, but also recordings uh, for uh, places like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, the Apple in Amsterdam, Nottingham Contemporary, uh, Western Front in Vancouver, or Steirischer Herbst, for example. And those are just a few places. Um, how they work, uh, we will also um, get to know later a little bit deeper and I'm very excited that uh, Stephanie and Justin can also then speak about their approach because it's also um, yeah, a, a very experimental approach and an approach that um, very much uh, I think also uh, foregrounds uh, the learning aspect and, and the pedagogy of, of music and the potential of course that, uh, that lies into processes of, of experimentation. So. Um, part study session, part uh, funk band, part opera, Microcosmos mines the, the canon of Black American music. And um, Justin and, and Stephanie, they consider listening language and learning through contemporary Black American music 
and uh, reimagine this in their performances and their recordings. So, um, and also, of course, in their community collaborations and physical work, uh, like the, the um, installation that we have in Dresden. So in Dresden, we have a room installation, um, which is also, and we will go into this uh, later also in the Q&A, and, uh, and Stephanie and Justin will, will also talk about their, um, their inspiration for the, the particular elements of this installation. Um, is composed or the center are basically two speaker frames out of which then music emanates and uh, and takes over the, the whole space. And um, so they work as an improvisation, as a trial uh, for their compositions and um, they use basically also or they create new sounds, new words, and new feelings from uh, an existing vocabulary of writing and of music. So these live compositions, or it's maybe it's recompositions. I would I would call them. Um, they often take the form of of musical studies, of samples, of improvisation. So um, their their influence, uh, or they have very different influences, of course. Um, so. The pedagogical background I already mentioned, uh, for example, also Orff Schulwerk is, uh, is one of the influences, or Bela Bartok's uh, Microcosmos, obviously, um, it, it's in the name, and uh, his pi uh, piano learning exercises. Um, so you have these methodologies of musical learning um, that come together then with the Black American Church uh, and, uh, and musical traditions, um, and they really examine um, um, the, the limits of speech, the, the limits of maybe also the sable, um, and they put it together with the politics of the quiet. Of the quiet. Um, and of course, it's uh, very much then uh, focused uh, or a designated focus on, on the Black American experience. Um, yes, so this was the, the little uh, spiel from my side, the, the introduction. Uh, now I would hand it over to Stephanie, um, who is here, and, uh, and also Justin. Stephanie will just give a very brief um, introduction into how the, the listening session is, uh, is structured, and then uh, Justin will start it. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was an amazing... Uh amazingly comprehensive and generous introduction to this practice. I'm so, um, so happy, so excited to have been able to work with you and really happy to be here. So for this listening session, Justin and I really conceive this as um, a chance for you to walk through with us as we uh, experience work from the whole kind of span, the whole lifetime of Microcosmos as a project. Um, we encourage you to walk around, to sing along, um, to you know, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do as you experience this microcosmos radio. Um, we'll also be in the chat and we'll be happy to um, answer questions or um, just experience your observations and um, feelings. Um, so um, please do feel free to share. And Justin's gonna say, Excuse me, Justin's going to say a few words about um, the, the track list for today. Hey, what's up? Um, I too am very excited to be here. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you everyone at Albertinum for making this happen so that we could share some work with you all. Um, so we're going to just kind of let things play. Um, there are a handful of tracks that we're going to share. Um, the first is from Microcosmos. The performance, What a Wonderful, uh, which was performed in 2016 at Festival Styrosha Epst. And then we're gonna go with a couple of tracks from a live performance at uh, Nottingham Contemporary from 2018, I believe that performance was, um, but from a piece uh, performance we made in 2017. Uh, and that will be kind of around the work we did uh, with Gil Scott's, uh, Gil Scott Heron's song, We Almost Lost Detroit. So those tracks are called Runnin' and you'll hear a speech called Black Men and Monster Movies. Uh, then we're gonna go into the tutorial track of the Microcosmos album, Another Time, This Time, One Time, also deals with the uh, Gil Scott Heron material. Deals with is not quite that uh, accurate um, way to describe it, but you will hear. Um, and then we're gonna go with a mix down of a two channel installation we did for Albertinum as a part of the One Million Roses for Angela Davis. Um, 
exhibition. Uh, we call these Black Gold, Black Gold One and Two, and it's kind of a mix down of both channels that play independently in the sound work in the museum. So here we go. I'm just gonna jump right in and hopefully this share goes very smoothly um, and enjoy.
so they asked me to find out how black people felt about not being, because we like horror movies. We go to all of them, but we're not in them. So I went to speak to a well-known producer of horror movies, and I came at him straight up. I said, look here, man, what's happening? How come we can pay to be in the monster movie and see it, but ain't never none of us on the screen? He said, well, Gil, what we have is a credibility problem. I said, oh, shit, you ain't gonna tell me. <laughs> I said, what, what's that mean? He said, everybody knows monsters cannot catch black people. I understand what he means. You see, you go to a horror movie, you see a bunch of people, and you try to figure out who's gonna live. Well, if it's a monster movie, we gonna live. The motherfucking monster go, doo doo, doo doo. Ain't gonna catch no brother. On 14th Street in the neighborhood, you can whisper the word junkie. They won't say nothing. But if you whisper the word monster, a junkie will turn into Jesse Owens. The only problem with this is that white people can't run. Because as soon as they see the monster, they go, oh, shit. And they fall the fuck down. And we'd be emotional about that shit. We'd be saying, get up, motherfucker, get up. Tell somebody, get up. They'd be laying there. Do, 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 do. Brother could have got up, go and get something to eat, lay, get back. Do, do. So I said, well, look here, man. All the monsters ain't slow. So why don't you put us in a movie where the monster's quick? So, well, you know, Gil, what we were going to do was put a black person in the movie Jaws. I said, oh, shit, that would have been wild. Why didn't it work? He said, well, let me show you on the screen here. Pulled out a screen. I saw him, he had on his little director's hat and shit. He turned around, he said, Willie. That was the brother. He said, Willie, I want you to climb down here along this side here. I want you to scoot over here, and then I want you to jump in the water. Willie said, run that back. Willie said, I heard the first part. He said, slide down here. Then go over here, and then do what? Jump in the water. The water over here? Jaws is in the motherfucking water. Why would I do that shit? Jaws is in the water, did you see that brother? So the director had a problem. He had a credibility problem. Because once black people know Jaws is in the water, the movie's over. We're not going in the motherfucking water for no reason. So he said, then I had a clever idea. I decided to make a black person the first victim. This would be before you knew that Jaws was in the water. I said, well, shit, that don't work. What happened? He said, black people can hear the music. But they do, do, do. They must love Jaws in the motherfucking water. Get out the water. So here comes that shark with his band. You see, movies are all about whose side you're on, who you want to win. When I went to see the movie Jaws, I was on Jaws' side. Yeah, I was rooting for Jaws. Because as a black man, I can understand being fucked with when you're where you're supposed to be. Jaws was in the water. Where the fuck you want him? You see, if Jaws pull up on shore, rent a car, come over to your house and fuck with you, we got a problem. But Jaws was in the water. They rented a boat and went out there to fuck with Jaws. I said, eat them some bitches, no problem. You got to root for the thing that's in the right. Time. 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 
Inspires. 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 Rise. Rise. Mm. Rise. Baby. Babies, babies, babies. Oh, 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 oh. Survive, survive, survive. Almost. Almost. Detroit. One more time. Detroit. 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 Station, station, sleeps, 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 annihilation, annihilation, annihilation. Can I hear one more time, sorry? Annihilation Survive, 
Detroit. One more time. Detroit. Detroit. Time. Time.
Detroit. Detroit. Destroyed. 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 What use are flowers? What use are songs? What use are flowers? What use are songs? What use are flowers? What use are songs? What use is soft? What use is louder? What use are songs? What use are flowers? What use is yours? What use is ours? What use are flowers? What use are flowers? Are flowers food? Do I need flowers? Is pleasure a nutrient? Our leaves. What use is water? What use are flowers? What use is naming our needs? Can't a need be indescribable? Can't a pleasure be unnameable? Can't a desire be impossible? What of desire? What about flowers? Do -do.
comfort to tend, to furnish, to suckle, to foster, to swim. To provide, to supply, to support, to let go. To feed, to flow, to sustain, to promote. To admire, to adore, to preserve, to cling. To defend, to embrace, to harvest, to seed. To ripen, to blossom, to mellow, to prime. To season, to cradle, to shoulder, to hold. Do do do. 
What use is singing? What use are songs? What if I'm tired? What use? What if? What? When? Again? Do 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 To vacate, to narrow, to taper, to limit, to lessen, to lower, to relax. To decrease, to unload, to release, to reduce, to exhaust, to consume, to uncharge, to unfill, to deplete, to unpack. To sap, to shrink, to dry, to drain, to cut, to bleed. To sap, to sap. To shrink, to dry, to drain, to cut, to bleed. To clear, to free, to off, to ease, to draw away. To unsaturate, to unoccupy, to lose yourself, to Thank you. <laughs> that was really great. Now I feel like I don't even want to talk anymore. <laughs> no, of course, we're here to talk. But um, I mean, I, I also very much, I mean, we, we have done this uh, over the past year, basically, in this um, constellation over zoom all the time and we've been working on this all the time i mean we so so i also appreciate basically the the technical possibilities that the pandemic is also giving us so people can listen in from from different places and uh we can convene here um in in such a way um so in in dresden it's already evening it's uh six o'clock at night so also the mood of course is a bit different than for you guys in new york um like 
it's noon, I guess. And, and I just saw that Lewis Watts, who's also a fellow artist of the exhibition, he tuned in from California. So even earlier. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was that was very, um, very beautiful. And uh, I, I think it would um, be good if we just um, start from like, from the end, I guess, from black gold and, um, and how also black gold, like what, what part black gold also plays in, um, in the installation in Dresden. So um, because it's a multi part installation, and it's and this is one part. Um, so I, yeah, it would be just great if you could just elaborate a little bit about the background um, of the installation and space, the different parts, of course. Um, and then also, of course, about the, the libretto, because that was very poignant also in, in the last piece, so in Black Gold, that we heard from the list. Um, and uh, I mean, for me, it's always uh, for, for Black Gold and like coming to the space and, and, and because you like climb up a staircase and, and, and it like very much like seeps through, um, through the staircase. So you hear um, parts of it already and then you like make your way towards it and it very much accompanies you throughout the space and throughout like looking at other works as well. And um, very much also sets the tone and the mood, um, which, um, which is always, yeah, very, um, also like it has, of course, a, a mel melancholy. There, there is this like very strong element of, of melancholy uh, in, in there. And uh, for me, of course, it's all, it was also interesting to think about this in, just in this in this way that um, maybe melancholy could also be a way um, to the truth, yeah, um, in in a way to to articulate this. Um, yeah, so I would hand it over to you guys. I can start. Um, Go for yeah, it. Justin. I mean, we can both talk. Um, thank you so much for. Uh, this invitation, Kathleen, and it was really beautiful to have the experience of um, moving through all those works together. Um, sometimes it's hard to take the time to listen carefully and, you know, in fellowship with others. Um, so this was um, really lovely. And uh, in, you know, in, re in regards to your last set of questions um, about the most recent work. So the you know, it's funny, the way that Justin and I have worked together, we um, really approach microcosmos as a practice. It's an ongoing practice. It's a kind of endless stream. And uh, any any given installation or exhibition or recording is re really feels like it's kind of bracketing um, a particular moment within a much longer thread. And so when I think about the origin of this work, I it you know, I think about every conversation that we've had, Kathleen, and how um, important those have been, and the work that Justin and I have done, um, so much of which isn't uh, visually or orally represented in the installation, but forms an important part of the, um, the kind of genealogy and inheritance of the installation. Um, the exhibition in does include multiple parts, as you mentioned, um, including two distinct sound installations excuse me i have to cough just <laughs> can you take it up sure um so there are two kind of uh sound pieces which you've heard two separate channels um that's the black gold work which are kind of these speaker sculptures that are kind of have flowers mounted to them and um they kind of operate independently and i don't know if i guess i i if I can jump back just a little bit to also tracking those moments of remembering every conversation and every moment that led up to this, I literally just thought of the room we were in. Every once in a while, we'll uh, book a rehearsal room just to even meet. Um, uh, and I think it was, the weather was like transitioning. I remember being somewhat hot, but also being kind of cold. <laughs> and that still is always hot. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's a true thing. I'm always hot, always sweating. Um, usually. <laughs> um, but there was a moment in one of our meetings before we even, it was the moment that we decided to kind of work with the Nina Simone song and this moment uh, at Morehouse College and this very particular 
tone um, and also bringing in a voice that we felt like in line with uh, through our mothers. It was just a really impactful and powerful moment. And it was one of those times when the kind of the aha moment was as palpable and powerful to us as like everything um, that we've built. Um, so for us, like being able to kind of um, kind of sustain that moment um, has been really a pleasure and to hear you know where everything ended up was really really great but yeah so there are also works that do not emit sound in this installation which i guess include two sculptures that are um kind of reference our mothers um, they i guess we call them for our mothers in a way um so there is a, there are a lot of i guess layers to this work um but yeah I'm, I'm gonna be hopping all over the place because I'm a little nervous and <laughs> I got nervous about pushing go <laughs> and like, is this gonna work? And um, so I just started to relax a, a few moments ago. <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, no, sorry, sorry about my coughing spell. I don't know where that came from. Um, but just um, uh, to finish, I guess, answering Kathleen's question. Um, so the the um, speaker sculptures, the um, two speaker sculptures are two uh, distinct tracks which were mixed together for this listening session, uh, one of which is a vocal track and the other is an instrumental track. The vocal track features um, the vocalist Jade Hicks, um, Justin's sister, uh, who's an amazing, amazing voice. And she is um, using a libretto that we wrote um, and interpret and um, uh, uh, using a, a melodic material derived from Nina Simone's To Be Young, Gifted and Black um, to kind of interpret improvisationally um, with some guidelines and suggestions that we made for her. Um, uh, this um, this 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 stuff. So she's singing um, this really expansive text uh, within um, pretty rigid, pretty specific constraints. And the libretto itself, um, um, we you know we built it together improvisationally through conversation. But it was very particularly inspired by a play by Lorraine Hansberry, um, the play that she was finishing um, when she passed away. Um, it was published after her death. It was called um, is called What Use Are Flowers. And it's a play that uh, imagines the possibility of uh, language and art and politics after the end of the world. It's a kind of post-apocalyptic novel or um, play. Um, and um, we spent a lot of time thinking about the way in which that play offers a particular, a set of questions that feel particularly poignant right now. And, um, and thought about them in relation to Nina Simone, Lorraine Hansberry and Nina Simone being very close and um, Lorraine Hansberry's um, uh, To Be Young, Gifted and Black, uh, her uh, autobiography uh, and um, the play based on that autobiography having formed the text, textual inspiration for the song To Be Young, Gifted and Black. I'm trying to share my screen um, so we can maybe also see a little bit of the work. Um, I think that would be helpful to, um, to just like get just an impression also of like how it looks in space and uh, what the, the different elements are um, that you've mentioned and, and um, I don't know if you see my cursor because I, I really loved this during the listening session that you like saw like Justin's cursor just like move around a little bit all so the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was really nice actually. So um, I will do I the same really now. There. I was really, really listening with you, I was. <laughs> Um, and of course here you see, um, this is in, in the space and um, and you see the um, you see the speaker frames here, um, and and also the uh, the the dried flowers uh, draped all, like over it. Um, it uh, also uses uh, vintage fabric um, to also somehow like go into this moment uh, of the 
of the late 60s, early 70s, um, that also um, houses, of course, the, the, the songs of, of, uh, of Nina Simone, like the particular song, of course, that um, she wrote for, for her friend, Lauren Hansberry. And, um, and then you see also the, the boards uh, with um, details um, of, um, of, the, of photographs. And, uh, and I like this also this back and forth between, of course, um, a very personal approach to, to, this, uh, to this time, to this uh, sensibility also of this time very much. And, uh, and then, of course, iconic photographs um, of Nina Simone, of Lauren Hansberry, and all decorated with those wilted flowers, dried flowers, uh, vintage pins. And, um, and here you also see then um, also, um, I think uh, Justin mentioned this also, like uh, that you have um, this moment to to connect or to to unearth family history and um, and also this uh, the sentiment of 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 that of that moment uh, very much. Um, for me, it would also um, be very interesting to know um, like now that we've uh, talked about the work um, a little bit to, to think about your approach in general uh, in working together. So maybe you could like sketch out your working process and also the, the different elements that come because um, also with, uh, with this work, I mean, there, there, there are all of those, like the process is, is you know, it's, it's not ending basically, of course, it's, a, it's something that, you know, it's, it's a study without end, like to, to use Morton's word, where it's, um, um, and, um, and, and how you, you basically like think together also uh, this element of, of rehearsal, of live performance, of recording, of translating um, your thoughts, those sentiments, uh, something that's also not tangible in physical space. Uh, so into, into objects. Um, Sure. Well, I, I mean, I guess I would <clears throat> start out. Um, in, uh, I guess I would start with how we started, which um, I was invited to um, work with Stephanie. Um, kind of, we had a mutual friend, a composer, Courtney Bryan, who I was working with at the time on a piece, and she and Stephanie were working on Stephanie's work, Promise Machine. And so I came onto that project as a music director and ended up kind of collaborating a little bit on, well, a lot of it on uh, kind of bringing the music ideas off the page a little bit. Um, and from there, we were invited as a duo to um, participate in a festival, Festival Styrische Epst. Um, we were invited by Luigi Fassi, uh, curator. And so really, I mean, Promise Machine, uh, initially kind of like identified for us like some overlap in our interests and in these in, in I guess big ways but also like okay cool I'll be able to work on this project with this person and, and feel comfortable and like have fun and maybe nerd out a little bit um, but I think it was pretty clear uh, after we started doing those things mainly nerding out on things like falsetto and um, different types of like delivery and in, in, in singing that were like bordering on speech and all these like little moments that you think are perhaps full and worlds of themselves to you but you'd never know if people are really digging into those moments the way you are and so when we kind of realized that that's what was happening um i guess we were fortunate enough to have an opportunity present itself pretty soon after uh, we did Promise Machine. And so from there, I would say our process has grown a lot, even listening through all the work um, that we just heard. Uh, I think when we started out, uh, the piece you heard in, in Grotz, uh, with the soloist kind of singing this sprawling libretto where she's singing, she's using three pitches. And that piece um, did kind of, it was like, okay, we, we could kind of see one element, a scale that we wanted to work with. And there was this uh, definitely a, a desire to work within a set of rules or a framework that offered a lot of freedom once you were really good at using those rules. Um, and I think that was like a real, um, an important like anchor. And uh, that was like us really figuring out 
the way microcosmos as a as a duo could be thinking um and that was a very straightforward performance in that it was mostly vocals it was singing we did stroll through a museum and there were a few moments with instruments and electronics but it was very straightforward it was vocal and there were no objects necessarily created uh in that work it was very much a performance um and that offered a freedom in itself, but it did offer also kind of this uh, little window into what we could maybe do next. And I think from there, the ways we work um, kind of appear with each um, phase, uh, I would say. Yeah. I would add that, um, you know, as, as Justin mentioned or alluded to often the first step is choosing a single resource like a single source material um, and sometimes we circle around a few before before finding one that really speaks to our interest at the friction between music and language and um, often we have like a something you know maybe a specific performer in mind or a specific performance problem or a specific formal question that we know we're going to want to explore like that we're already kind of you know as we're working on one as we're finishing one piece we're, we're already sort of thinking to the next and what we might want to try to do um so for example in relation to the current work i would say that we we had been thinking a lot about um we knew that we wanted to work with a woman vocalist and um we knew that we wanted to work with material that lent itself to kind of thinking pedagogically, which is an important part of our practice. And we also knew that we wanted to work with someone who, um, who, with whom our relationship felt very intimate. So in the past, for example, with, um, with our um, recent work, another time, this time, one time, um, we chose a song by Gil Scott Heron that was not itself something that we were super uh, close to when we started. In fact, it was, in some ways, it was our distance from that material that made it possible for us to um, get so in the weeds with the um, the kind of analytical approach that we took um, and to, to really um, approach it from the outside and the inside at the same time. But we knew uh, for the current work that we wanted to choose um, to choose something that um, was like deeply familiar, and we knew that we wanted to address also our relationship with our with our own parents, um, our own families, um, head on. Like we knew that we wanted that to be a um, an important structural feature of the work, and so um, we, which led us to to be on Gifted in Black. And often our process involves um, after we've after we've selected the the source material. Um, the song we spend, you know, most of our time listening to it together, um, and um, and sometimes we'll 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 kind of um, we we will take um, forms and ideas um, and challenges that are fr from kind of outside of the song and push them into the into the song or you into the process in order to see what happens. For example, we spend a lot of time actually working in dance studios developing choreography. Um, that interpreted, um, that interpreted to be young, gifted, and black, and also that interpreted passages from Lorraine Hansberry's plays as a different way to inhabit that material, um, um, uh, you know, really intimately as a different way to kind of live inside it. And although um, much of that work, much of that kind of movement practice, likely won't make its way directly into any aspect of the, you know, any future performance or any future you know, insulation or experience um, that might be a part of this body of work, um, but it still is a really important aspect of, you know, of the practice and the writing process and the journey. Um, and we tend to return again and again to the materials that we develop in the process of making the work and sort of mine them and use them, um, see everything as, um, as kind of open and available uh, to engage, you know, uh, we're building our own um, very porous, social, intimate archive um, that um, is, um, you know, that can be entered and used in so many different ways, and which is um, one of the ways that we think about um, how teaching and learning function or, you know, it's one of the ways that we think about the pedagogical um, aspect 
of the work um, is just to, you know, to, th to think about the ways in which we are um, always absorbing and giving and absorbing and giving and, um, and also sustaining um, the, the kind of tools and strategies that we use, that everyone uses to, to hold um, what we love from the past into the present and to carry it into the future. And, um, and we, we think of this practice as very much a, a kind of holding practice. Definitely. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, yeah, Justin, I, I also, um, maybe we can just like jump in, into like my next um, inquiry maybe and then um, right away because I, I think it, it connects very much to, to what Stephanie just said. Um, uh, I mean, for example, also we, we listened to a part uh, from, from, from your record uh, another time, this time, one time. And for me there, I mean, this, this element of call and response, of course, is very strong um, on, on, that, uh, on that piece. Um, and, and especially this like holding something, but of course in, in a community um, of performers, of friends, of artists, um, how to develop this further. So there's also the, the back and forth um, between of course uh, the choir and then the lead. Um, so this this would be something that I'm interested in, and um, and then of course um, I mean you ha you have this like family element of course there too, um, which uh, which is also um, very beautiful um, to to have this connection, to have something that is um, or to, to to develop something with someone who's so familiar maybe, um, but then like try to address um, also. Dif different um, different sets of questions together uh, with maybe this familiarity that that you have with one another at the same time to to take this to a different place. Sure, um, <clears throat> I would say in terms of the kind of community aspect, it's interesting. I think we've um, often this might be the most social event we've done <laughs> in terms of <laughs> like. Um, being just kind of here, this is happening. It's very much available to people and very public, I guess. Um, but one thing that you're kind of hearing that that I hear when I listen back to the tutorial, especially with the moments of, of the chorus, is is something that we've talked about trying to mock up in terms of the relationship that this work has to the community at large. Um, this feeling that partnered or group study or recognition or remembering, um, learning is all very, besides it being kind of important, it's fun. And it's also um, a way to, I mean, you can get so many things out of that. I mean, but I think it's something that we've, um, like I said, started to uh, really kind of think more clearly and directly about in terms of how people can access this work. Um, but I think inherently in a call and response, yeah, this, this kind of community feeling is something that we're really trying to um, utilize, especially with this song. Um, and even just thinking about when we say we almost lost Detroit or something like that, like the song being about a collective, it's um, it just kind of, I will say when we first recorded that, we thought we were going to be like manipulating things and cutting things and editing and making all kinds of like um, interventions in the audio. But the ingredient that felt the strongest when after we would listen back was this choral element that we were like, there's that just made the point for us in a way. Um, but uh, yeah, and then with in terms of like family, um, I work with my family a lot and music and singing was a way of communicating in my house and whatnot when I was growing up. But um, I think we, there's a way in which this project is kind of outside of my other practices or is this other thing, but it's actually engaging some of my friends and family in a way that is really direct. Um, I guess I can only just like say those things, you know, um, as far as like the experience of 
what it's like to develop something with your family. It's, it's just kind of in my world and in my, in my life and my work. So, um, but I will say that uh, that intimacy of having people who are kind of in the know and also available and just like in the next room um, and not just in this convenient way, but in a way that uh, kind of documents our spontaneity and how even on a small kind of um, scale, we can be really playful and kind of um, just go for ideas in a way. I don't know, there's a lot to say about that. Stephanie, I don't know if you wanna <laughs> jump in. I'm literally thinking about Quincy doing the performance with us in Nottingham. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, I mean, um, you said a lot. I, I think, you know, the only things I would add are that um, I spoke before about how important it is to create spaces in which, um, in which you know, ideas are shared and um, in which the, um, in which, you know, concepts or frameworks like learning and teaching become, you know, kind of porous. And, um, and um, we, one of the ways that we do that is often by, by giving the work itself a kind of pedagogical structure. So if we are learning as we perform if we're if you know if we have to relearn the material actually really you know not um not to perform the relearning but to actually relearn the material um as a part of the work um then it challenges um traditional kind of presentational approaches to performance which have um have have never been appealing to us and i think uh we've all we've um been really interested in finding other genealogies for understanding what performance can be. Um, and uh, there are so many ways in which, you know, kinship, um, these, you know, kind of close social relationships, family, um, including, including, you know, your born family and your, and your, your um, chosen family in which those serve as our, the kind of earliest sites for that kind of sharing. And, um, and so it, it's um, not surprising in a lot of ways that that has ended up being an important part of, an important part of the work and a kind of touchstone. Um, I, you know, I think it exists in some tension with this other thing that, that is often happening in the work where there's a, also a kind of alienation, <laughs> um, like a distancing and a, and a um, coming closer that um, that um, live alongside one another at the same time, and um, it's it's the the distance makes it possible to kind of turn something around and look at it from a different perspective, and to do that again, and to do it again, and do it again, um, to see um, every each new you know each um, kind of historical material or existing cultural material that we work with as um, a, a kind of endless resource that can be, you know, mined forever and ever and ever, um, and also everything new that we make as a, you know, as a part of that dialogue too. Um, so the that I think that um, that uh, push and pull, that tension, um, feels um, really characteristic of microcosmos and um, of our process. And I would say that you know, and I th I think there's some kind of way in which that reflects how Justin and I work together. Um, and, you know, there are some ways in which we, you know, know each other so well <laughs> and have, you know, we've like, you know, we've been, we've been working so closely together, but we also have long, you know, long periods of distance, um, like long periods in which we're working on other things. Um, Justin mentioned that this project feels um, kind of separate from other aspects of his work. And I think in some ways that's true for me too. Um, a collaboration has to have its own logic and its own compass and, it have, and you have to kind of always be together. That's one of the commitments that we made at the very beginning is that we wouldn't build any aspect of the work apart, that we would do everything um, kind of aligned, which means that we have to, you know, find time and ways to align um, and realign and realign. Like the number of times we've had, you know, had a conversation that's like, okay, what is this, what is this about? What are we doing? Um, it's, you know, like constantly kind of starting over, um, which is, I think, really important actually to, um, um, that, you know, there's not, there's, there is no complacency at any level in this practice. It's something that we always have to choose again and again. 
Absolutely. And I will say, I think part of that is because we're always like, there's always like one dash, maybe even like a good few handfuls of not knowing for each of us or not being expert in a thing and uh, always kind of keeping ourselves on the toes. And, and, and um, I guess it's, it's about possibility. Um, I think each, you know, phase, each body of work, each or each um, piece we've made uh, kind of has stretched us and kind of um, really allowed us to think outside our own boxes in this way that feels somehow safe, even if we're both like, I don't know what I'm doing right this <laughs> in this moment, but it feels okay. And I think that's also a part of what the practice is offering is it's more like can you get through a moment in time or can you find your way through something with a partner, um, but also be okay with not knowing with that person too. And, um, and I think as far as uh, with, in terms of like working with family too, um, there's a really beautiful relationship to uh, expertise or um, interest. So in some ways it's the interest that makes it really the most compelling thing to work with someone you know because they can kind of see where you're going and it makes it very exciting and it also can interpret the work really accurately or um, beautifully accurately is not even quite the right word for a microcosmos thing i guess it is but isn't but <laughs> um but so like you know we're, we're also like making it available to people in this way um in our lives and so you know I don't know how much Quincy has heard, but <laughs> there are moments in my house, especially if you heard my wife singing on this uh, on this uh, listening session in the another time this time one time album. But how many times she's heard me sing, especially the Gil Scott material, <laughs> like she's as familiar with it as I am. And even from another perspective, which made the record part really fun. Um, it was yeah, and that's that's something you you. That's like the mushy part of making art where it's like, yeah, I have a buddy who can actually do this thing. You know, these are people that we actually kind of love. And I think that record has that vibe to it. I really appreciate that about that, those takes. I think it's also, um, I mean, also your collaboration is, is, um, is, is very interesting in those terms because you, as a professional musician, as a professional vocalist as well, um, you come together with Stephanie and, and she has, she has a background also in literature, in visual arts. And, um, and I guess this like trial, this like back and forth, like how to translate something that is also so, um, so physical and so, you know, instantaneous also as a performance, as a musical iteration. Um, but then also to, you know, to, to, to add those layers, like to add the layers of text, to add, of, co of course, then like a physical element um, and, and to, um, yeah, and to try and to see um, what, what this can be. And, um, and I, I also, I think I, I also like your approach in, in this way that it's not, it's not something that you can very much um, like box. So, so it's not like this one element um, and that's the finished work, but it's something that like is continuously and that, you know, reappears and appears in different forms and formats um, and that, um, that, that, that develops and uh, evolves maybe and or, or also like gets smaller in a way. It's, I mean, it can go either way. And, and I think this is, this is also very beautiful. And, uh, and maybe it would also be interesting um, to hear also like the, the next iterations also or where, where your work is going, um, what, uh, what your next plans are. Um, because I mean, we, we had also like many plans for 2020, of course, also with this work, um, which are not finished, of course. So <laughs> this was just the pause, it was the prelude. Um, but um, but also like to to see where and and how it can it can uh, take different shapes. Um. <laughs> so um, I guess uh, the work in the exhibition at Albertinum is uh, we kind of conceived as uh, well. 
I guess I'll start out by saying I consider, and I think we both consider this practice as kind of like an environment too, or the things we make, especially when we make a, an installation, like it's, a, it's kind of a housing of ideas and possible connections to be made with either the source material or the song that we're working with, or the actual things that we're making on the way to this opera. This was a thing that we were kind of planning on doing, and we would have probably performed it or a piece of it a couple of times by now. And uh, so yes, enter 2020 and it's big bad self. And <laughs> so we are kind of like, it's a, we're in a mode of surrendering a little bit to um, some of the constraints, I guess, of, of the time, but also um, really trying to hold on to what the big show could be, the fully realized version of this opera, um, what it could be, uh, but then also what we can do on the way that points in that direction, um, but also feels like a thing in itself, not just, um, not just a room, I guess. Um, we're literally in the middle of figuring this out right now and how we can create the sense of opera or the feeling of an opera or being at a live performance even as you possibly stroll through an empty building so <laughs> this is uh these are some things that we're interested in but but in those kind of in that problem there are a lot of things that we um are kind of excited about especially after being able to um build some of the works we made for uh, for the one million roses show um we became excited about um, some of the types of objects we could use to kind of perform a thing um, and ways in which actually like a little bit of a technical background in theater and um, might come into play. So we're thinking about things, I guess. I don't want to say too much because <laughs> that could be trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I was actually going to speak to the other part of Kathleen's observation about um, like our different backgrounds and how that interacts in the work, um, uh, and um, and just say that yeah. I mean, of course, Justin has um, tremendous patience, um, <laughs> and we've um, had it, it has been super interesting. Um, I think we always conceived when we started Microcosmos, um, we always conceived it as a practice that. That was a kind of, that that um, because it comes from a place of not knowing, because it privileges that space of uh, learning. Um, there's a way in which um, multiple points of multiple avenues into the musical material, into the you know conceptual material, the performative material, multiple avenues are available and um, and and welcomed. Um, it's funny because over time, I think so much of the way that we think, at least in relation to this work, has um, has kind of converged. Um, we might have started <laughs> in places that were a little bit more distant, um, and now um, and now think alike in a, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but I'll say, you know, although although um, Justin's Justin's you know background isn't in um, literature per se, of course he as a songwriter is also a writer. And for me, although I um, have, you know, have not been a performing musician since I was in bands in high school, um, I, um, you know, have my own sort of point of entry into and relationship to you um, and training in um, music. And, um, and so there's been um, quite a lot of overlap in the, 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 these, the, the kind of um, spaces of our interests in focus and expertise. Um, I think, you know, and some of the, like some of the challenges, you know, of course it's not easy and we face a lot of challenges when working together. And a lot of those have to do with, you know, having different vocabularies and um, sometimes be, being sort of oriented in slightly different directions in relation to what the work is or what it can be, um, especially as it, in, as it connects to our other work. Um, but, I, it, you know, I think that that is part of what makes this particular collaboration so, 
so you know fascinating and important. I think it's really important for me as an artist to um, to be working in a space um, of discomfort much of the time. Like I can't really imagine not doing that. And I know there are some people who mostly do things that they feel like excellent at all the time, but um, I'm kind of the opposite. Um, and working so closely with someone else means that you're, you know, every encounter is a little bit of a leap of faith. Um, and that that leap um, is, you know, is very, is like constantly exhilarating and also, you know, always like difficult, like always a challenge. Um, but we, as Justin said, we're very excited um, to, to think about the opera, um, uh, you know, it's already had to undergo many changes um, since our first proposal. And um, it's always a challenge, especially with a body of work that's so sh such a shape-shifting practice um, to figure out what is, you know, which ambitions are really important to hold on to and which ones um, can just continue to evolve as the conditions change. Um, so that's something that we've been really navigating as we think about the you know, immediate next steps, like the immediate next set of performances. And also as we think about the, the longer horizon for this particular material. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, we would also have to close at that point. I mean, we could go on forever, I know. Um, <laughs> and we've done this also, uh, and I always very much enjoy enjoy this. Um, but, um, but I think uh, we are uh, we, we want to start in the Sunday into the Sunday with this um, beautiful experience that we have. Um, yeah, so um, I think I, I will close this now, um, but of course I want to thank also our um, technical director in the background, Elena Riga, who um, just made, uh, figured the whole technical part out. Um, thank you so, so much. And I will um, will end with also uh, announcing, and, and some of you um, already know, of course, Stephanie and Justin know, uh, that uh, that the work uh, One Giant Step, so the the installation with Black Gold uh, will become uh, part of the of the permanent collection of the Albertinum, um, and I would like to thank Outset Germany Switzerland for uh, for also supporting us uh, at the museum to to make this possible. We are very excited um, that uh, this work will will grace uh, our collection now. And um, and have this uh, have this yeah beautiful um, feedback also of course to 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 the works that we have already and um, yes so I thank you very very much uh, for for taking the time for also sharing um, sharing the background of of the works and uh, of your way of working of your practice and um, yes thank you and. Hopefully um, we do this again at some point, uh, at another point in, in the microcosmos experience. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to, to learning what, where you will be then. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Thank you.